Pastor Otabel, our interactive discussion program that brings scriptural perspective to the big issues of life. My name is Albert Okran, and on behalf of Dr. and Mrs. Otabel, let me say a big thank you to you for joining us for this all-important broadcast coming to you from the International Central Gospel Church. And so today, we want to begin a discussion about the Holy Spirit, who he is, what he does, and how we can get to know him even more. And helping us with answers to some of the most important questions that we have today, it's my honor to welcome Dr. Mensah Otabo, General Garcia of the International Central Gospel Church. Pastor Otabo, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this as always. Thank you. It's an honor. I'm also here with my colleagues, Reverend Eric Hebeku of ICGC Open Heavens. Pastor Eric, good to see you. Thank you, Pastor Albert. And Pastor Patrick, could you hear with me at Christ Temple? Pastor Patrick, it's always a blessing. It is. Always a blessing. Right. So let's start with those watching and how they can get their loved ones to be part of this amazing experience in the scriptures. Okay. Well, if you're watching us on any of our social media platforms, this is what we always encourage you to do. Hit the share button now. If you're watching us on Facebook, create a watch party. On Instagram, Twitter, on YouTube, share the, the stream. Invite your friends and your loved ones to be part of tonight's broadcast. Now, if you also have a question, you can post it in our comment box below, or you can send it to us as a direct message. I'll be very glad to ask Dr. Otabel to speak to it. Now, if you're watching us on TV and on radio, you can call a friend to also call a friend to join the broadcast. And if you have a question, you can send it to us on WhatsApp. And our WhatsApp number is 055-249-4111. The number again is 055-249-4111. Don't forget, if you're watching us internationally, to add the country code PLUS 233 to the number. So sh share, share, and share the experience. Indeed. There's so much we want to learn about the Holy Spirit. But the first will help us to appreciate the person of the, the Holy Spirit and his work throughout the expanse of Scripture. Uh, we, we first encounter the Holy Spirit in the second verse of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, uh, talks about the state of the earth as without form, darkness is upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God is moving upon the face of the waters. It's very interesting when you compare the verse 1 of Genesis and the verse 2, because the verse 1 says, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 2, it says, and the Spirit of God. Now, if uh, the Bible was minded to just repeat what it had said in verse 1, it would have said in verse 2, and God was moving upon the face of the waters. But then it pays attention to a concept, the Spirit of God. Uh, that is not to say that the Spirit of God is not God, but it, it's, it is an expression of a personhood of God uh, that is at work. And so the Holy Spirit is introduced very early. And then the verse 3, God said the Word of God uh, comes into being, uh, and, and Jesus later uh, is known as the Word of God. So you see uh, God created, the Spirit of God moving, and the Word of God in manifestation. So the Holy Spirit has been active in our world, even when there were no human beings. Uh, he didn't become active because there were people. He is active in the process of creation. He's active in the process of reconstruction. He's active in the process of bringing life to the earth and is active even in the life of, uh, of human beings because God breathed into man uh, the breath of life, uh, which in other translations we say the spirit of life, uh, who is the same Holy Spirit who was hovering upon the face of the waters, now breathed into man, and man becomes uh, a living soul. In, in other words, the life of man was energized or activated by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has been present in the whole process. Um, and then we see him as at, at work uh, in the story of Noah, when God says that his spirit will not strive with man. Uh, in other words, that the Holy Spirit was active in bringing the knowledge of God to people, but the people resisted. And at a certain point, the Holy Spirit had to withdraw from convicting man 
and then judgment comes and destruction comes. So you see this work of the Holy Spirit continuing and actively we see the Holy Spirit at work in, uh, in the life of Israel, uh, in the establishment of the priesthood, the, the establishment of the gifts uh, of, of the prophet, and then the gift of the king uh, that God gave to the children of Israel. You see the Holy Spirit at work. And then we see him uh, inspiring the prophets in their declaration uh, throughout the Old Testament and definitely one of the pivotal works, the uh, presence of the Holy Spirit, is at the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, when he descended uh, and it appeared like a dove. He is not a dove, but it appeared like a dove descending, but that was the Spirit of God. And then we see him energizing, filling, and using the disciples on the day of Pentecost. So uh, through the, the whole length of the Bible, from Genesis right through to the Old Testament, to the New Testament, uh, we see the presence of the Holy Spirit. So just as a follow-up, you mentioned that he's not a dove. And we also know that when he appeared on the day of Pentecost, it was like tongues of fire. Would you help throw light on the issue of not being a dove? And what about the fire? Uh, you, you know, the, 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 these are biblical symbols. Um, the, God sometimes appear like uh, fire. You know, Moses saw God uh, like fire in a bush that was not consumed. It doesn't mean God is fire. In other words, the next time you light a fire, that's not God. And when you catch a dove, that's not the Holy Spirit. But his work, uh, he, the, the, the dove symbolized. And the reason why he symbolized that on, on the baptism of Jesus because of the way he overshadowed Jesus. Because the, the Bible says that he was... He lighted on him, or he settled on him as a dove. It's almost as, as if a dove has come to sit on him. And, and that's just a picture of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is not uh, these physical elements. Thank you. Um, in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, Jesus promises the disciples of the coming of the Holy Spirit. But some people have interpreted Jesus' prophecy of the coming of the Holy Spirit as in the coming of a man who is a prophet, who has started a religious uh, movement. And any time you refer to the book of John 14, 26, talking about the helper who is going to lead us into all truth and confirm everything Jesus taught, reference is made by that sect to um, their religious leader. Um, did the Holy Spirit come in the form of a human? Um, I, I don't want to go too much in, into that because the, that in the biblical knowledge is a total fallacy, and I don't want to belabor that point. Um, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and the disciples on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is a spirit. Uh, is not a physical entity, a physical human being. Jesus was in a physical form, and because he was in a physical form, he was limited by the physical body. And so he could only dwell in his body. He couldn't dwell in other people. Uh, he couldn't live in anybody. Uh, so he had to leave so that the Holy Spirit could come. And the essence of that is so that he can fill individuals. As many as receive Christ are filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and that couldn't be said of any other human being. And then Jesus says the Holy Spirit will abide forever. And if somebody is supposed to be the Holy Spirit and he died, uh, couldn't, I don't think we should belabor it. I, that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a spirit. Okay. So, Doc, how critical is the Holy Spirit to the New Testament believer? The Holy Spirit is the presence of Christ with us. When Jesus physically left us, he continued to minister with us. Um, the, the book of Mark, the last chapter, says that when he had told them that the signs that will follow them, uh, the believers, he says they went out preaching the word and the Lord working with them uh, and confirming his word with signs and wonders. How could Jesus be working with them? Uh, because he was in heaven. He was working with them through the active presence of the Holy Spirit. 
so the, the New Testament believer or believers of today, uh, when we say that we have received Jesus into our heart, we haven't used, received a physical person into our heart. We haven't received a Jewish carpenter into our heart. When we say Christ lives in us, it's the spirit of Christ who is also the Holy Spirit. He is the one who comes to show Christ to us and reveal him to us and manifest him to us. So he is the one we receive. Eric? So, Doc, how can the average Christian practically work with the Holy Spirit, hear from him, and maintain an intimate relationship in all the areas of their life? Um, the, the, it's very difficult to relate to the Holy Spirit. And the reason is because when we read the Old Testament, we see God at work. And, and so it's very easy for us to see God as creator, his power, opening Red Sea, doing all these miracles. It's very easy for us to conceptualize Jesus, working his miracles, and so on. But then when it comes to the Holy Spirit, it's almost as if he's a disembodied entity. And it's very difficult for us to make sense within our senses of who he is. And so the first thing we do is to think of him as an influence and not a person. And when you say something is an influence, it means he's a force. And you don't have a relationship with a force. I don't have a relationship with, the, with electricity because electricity is a force. Uh, and, and so you, you only use it, but you don't relate to it. But the Holy Spirit is not to be used. He's to be related with, is to be known. And, and so the Bible talks about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Much of, of that comes by being conscious of him, being aware that he is with us, and also learning over time to identify his works and his movement, how he speaks, how he leads, how he directs. Uh, and, and it comes through um, a long time of fellowship. We've talked a bit about that in how to hear his voice and how he speaks to us. And, and because people find it difficult to relate to the Holy Spirit, they like to relate to people who are operating in the Holy Spirit. So instead of somebody listening to the Holy Spirit, he would rather listen to a prophet because the Holy Spirit doesn't seem like a real person. And, and, and so we have uh, outsourced his work to other people. You listen to him and tell me what he is saying. But the Holy Spirit must be known in his personhood uh, and, and, um, and be identified when he works and, and when he leads uh, and when we do that, our whole Christian life takes on uh, a new form, and it becomes a very empowered Christian life uh, because you, you can actually see him at work in your life in real ways. Doc, let's stay with the, the works of the Holy Spirit or Richard Njobu in asking his question, is asking, must every Christian filled with the Holy Spirit speak in tongues? I'm a Pentecostal. I'm Protestant Evangelical Pentecostal. Um, so Pentecostal views uh, are what I share. But not every Christian shares the Pentecostal views. Um, there are people who believe that speaking in tongues is valid, but it's seized. And there are people who also believe it didn't cease. It continues, but not everybody has that as a gift. Um, if you look at the biblical records in the book of Acts, um, you would find that in instances when the Holy Spirit came upon people and it's recorded as such, there was always some attendant manifestation. In, in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, they spoke in tongues. Uh, chapter 4 says they were filled with the Holy Spirit at the same people again, but it doesn't say they, speak, they spoke in tongues. But <clears throat> in the home of Cornelius, they spoke in tongues. 
Uh, and Peter said that they received the Holy Spirit just as we did on the day of Pentecost. Um, I believe that speaking in tongues is normative or is normal to everybody who is filled with the Holy Spirit. And the person may decide not to exercise that ability, uh, but they have the ability. And uh, because if you read the, how the book of Acts puts it, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Pause. And they spoke and they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So you're talking about different things happening. Filled with the Holy Spirit, beginning, uh, being given utterance and beginning to speak in tongues. Now, a person can be filled with the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues because he chooses not to. But I believe that if, when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, they are given the utterance to speak in new tongues. So it's left to the person to take advantage that, of that, God that's has my them. position. Right. But, you know, there, there are many really beautiful, great Christians who have not exercised that gift. You know, indeed, one of my uh, all-time uh, role models is Billy Graham. And he was an evangelical Christian, um, believed in the work of the Holy Spirit, and moved in the power of the Holy Spirit with his evangelistic ministry, but didn't speak in tongues. Uh, and I'm not going to say he's less of a Christian than other people who, who spoke in tongues. Uh, but I believe that if Billy Graham wanted to speak in tongues, he would have spoken in tongues. Thank you very much, Mr. Patrick. Patrick. Okay. So, Doug, do the tongues of a believer, does it grow <sighs> over time, or it remains the same? Does it change? And um, you have spoken to monosyllab and the monosyllabic way of praying in tongues mm -hmm. and the call and response type. Yeah. Can you kindly speak to that as well? You know, the, the, the whole idea of speaking in tongues is, is a person speaking a known language. Uh, is it an unknown language? Uh, if you read the record of the book of Acts, the first instance, uh, the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They had no clue what they were saying. Uh, in other words, they didn't understand what they were saying. Uh, but there were Jews who had come from the diaspora. Remember, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was the uh, end of the Feast of Weeks. Uh, the fifth Feast of Weeks were seven days, first of all, seven, seven days, so 49, and the, fifth, the, the next day is the day of Pentecost. This is the 50th day uh, uh, is the day of Pentecost. So normally on those days, there is one of the three top uh, festivals of Israel, people would come, the Jews who had traveled would come to Jerusalem for the festival. So it was at that time that the Holy Spirit came. So these Jews who had come from different parts of the world uh, and had learned second languages, could identify that these guys were speaking the languages of the nations they had uh, traveled into. So it was they speaking the mighty works of God in those languages. Now remember, they were not evangelizing people in tongues. They were not even telling the people to be converted. They were praising God. So it's a prayer language. It's a worship language. Uh, it just happened that people had the worship they were offering. For their salvation, they didn't require speaking in tongues. Peter then rose and preached a language, uh, preached a message in the language of understanding, and, and then 3,000 of them got saved. So um, your question is, does it change? It's an utterance of the Holy Spirit. It's not a concoction of a man. If it's an utterance of the Holy Spirit, then you speak it as the Spirit gives utterance. Um, for some people, it may seem like a sound, a meaningless sound. But the Bible says, although we don't understand what we say when we speak in tongues, how be it in the Spirit, we are speaking mysteries. Now, when it says that in the Spirit, we are speaking mysteries, doesn't mean we are saying some strange things spiritually, but it's prayer, just like they had them on the day of Pentecost, magnifying God and praising him. In the spirit, we worship God. And um, the Holy Spirit then 
equips us with the right expressions to worship him. Now, sometimes people want to create their own language. And I've been in, you know, I, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1975. Um, and so I've been around Pentecostals for a very long time. Um, and I've seen all the efforts people try to make to sound more spiritual. And so they will speak in tongues with some accent of a sort. Uh, sometimes they think they can make their tongues more deeper and more powerful and, and, and impressive. I mean, that is not speaking in tongues. That is you making up words to impress yourself. But the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us utterance. And in speaking in tongues, you must be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and give expression to the impulses he's given to you. You don't make it up yourself. He gives you the flow. He gives you the words and the language to use. And so they spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. We don't give ourselves utterance. We speak in tongues with humility, trusting the Holy Spirit to give us the right utterance to express the right sentiment that the Holy Spirit wants us to express. And it's, it's a matter of faith and obedience and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. So talk about the monosyllabic and the polar response. Well, it's a new thing I've, I've seen people uh, doing, and this one shouts, and, and, and the other one responds it. Uh, I, I have no, no way of validating that from a biblical point of view. I, I, th I think it's, it's a man-made concoction. Thank you very much, Mr. Eric. Yeah. So is the Holy Spirit always an energizer for the supernatural or in the in extraordinary acts? Um, you know, um, I have read quite a bit uh, and studied uh, this phenomenon and also Christian history throughout the ages. And there are people who have been used by God supernaturally, miraculously, who never spoke in tongues. Um, so people would say, so what was happening? Is this is the Holy Spirit. I believe when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, they are given the ability to speak in tongues. But they can choose not to. That, that's my, my feeling. I may be wrong, but that's where I stand. If I get further clarification on this, I would uh, revise my, my, my notes on it. Uh, but th that's what I sincerely think uh, is the situation. So the Holy Spirit gives us power. Uh, and, and one of the things that uh, we are able to do is to manifest the power of Christ. So what Christ could do, we are able to do, not by ourselves, but by the enablement of the Holy Spirit. So uh, there is healing, and, and there are miracles, and, and things like that happen. And that is the active work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that is why we say that no human being or Christian is a healer. You know, uh, the healer is the, is, is the Holy Spirit. And, and he, he moves as he wills. And uh, he does what he wants to do. And if we're submitted to him, we see his power at work in our lives. But, but, but Doc, sometimes you, you find out that some people, uh, like, make a comment that, I now feel the Holy Spirit to do something. It's as if... One moment, they are not uh, under the anointing. Another time, they say they are under the anointing. How can you explain that? The, the Holy Spirit is ever-present in the believer, but he's not always working. He's always present. He's always alive in the believer. But just like, you know, I can live in my house, but it doesn't mean every time I'm doing something, you know, uh, sometimes people can be in, with me in the house and not see me and, uh, because I'm, I didn't go out to see them or they didn't come to, to say hello, and they may not see me. So the Holy Spirit is ever-present in the believer, but he's not always using the believer he's resident in. And so, yes, a, 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 a minister or a Christian can be in a situation where it's almost like you're minding your own business, and all of a sudden, just without any note of warning, the Holy Spirit begins to indicate something to you. And it, it could be maybe you are sitting with somebody, and all of a sudden, you're not 
just chatting about football or whatever. And then instantly the Holy Spirit gives you a word of knowledge, a knowledge about the person. And you tell the person, uh, this is just what the Holy Spirit told you. There's no service going on. It's just the Holy Spirit re revealing it. So, or sometimes you're just sitting there and you may feel just pray for this brother or pray for somebody uh, in America. You know, you know, all kinds of things come when we are working with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes in the night you wake up and you just feel to pray and a name comes to you and you pray. I mean, you just obey. You don't know what it means. You don't know whether the person is sick or whether the person... But in working with the Holy Spirit, we have just to be obedient. You know, I would rather be obedient and make a mistake than be disobedient. You know, so you just flow. Over time, you begin to understand his move a little better and become more sensitive and interpret these impulses a bit better. But when, when you are new... Uh, sometimes, you know, you get overzealous and, and make mistakes. But, you know, that's allowed. It's a learning process. If you just join us, this is Time with Pastor Otabo. Today we are looking at the Holy Spirit, his person, his work, and how we can get closer and relate to the Holy Spirit. Many of you have sent questions to us throughout the week about various issues, and we'll touch them as we go along. But Timothy Bannerman sends a very important question to Otabo. And the question is, does one need to be an academic or go to Bible school before they can be used by the Holy Spirit? And it's alluding to the fact that a great number of people used by the Holy Spirit were not academics. So is there a place for training in perfecting the gift of God's grace? The work of God is very large. It's very big, you know. And sometimes we limit the work of God to only one activity. I mean, let's take the, whole, the process of Bible translation. For, for me to read the Bible, somebody had to write it in English because Isaiah was not an Englishman uh, and Jesus wasn't an Englishman. The Bible was written in, in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. Uh, that's Old Testament and New Testament. For me to read the Bible now, somebody had to study Greek and know English and know how to translate that language to me. That definitely is a work of the Holy Spirit but it takes academic qualification to do that. Now, for the person who preaches from that Bible and go and say, well, John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world and just uh, preaches it for salvation, he may not have education, but he can take that verse and use it. But for that verse to come to him, the Holy Spirit had to use academics. So there is, the work of God is broad. Even for the preaching, for di preaching to different classes of people, intellectuals, uh, people who are agnostics, people who are cynics, you need to be more mentally uh, expressive than if you're just preaching to an ordinary person who just wants to believe something. You don't need education. So... God can use anybody, but academic training is very important. Uh, it doesn't limit the work of the Holy Spirit, but it's important if you want to go far uh, in, in the work of the, of the ministry. So, yes, um, there are people God uses uh, who have no academic training. Sometimes God starts with somebody who has no academic training, but for the work to be built up, they need uh, uh, people with academic training need to come in. And more and more increasingly, we are seeing that academic training is an aid to the Holy Spirit and not a detraction. You know, when, when we grew up, grew up in Pentecostalism, people didn't really appreciate academic training. But now we see that it's a complement. It's, it's an important addition to what God can use uh, uh, us for. Thank you. Yes, Patrick. Okay. Well, some have suggested that planning and having a well-structured church service limits the move of the Holy Spirit. Uh, order and structure inimical to the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. That's a very interesting question because we associate the Holy Spirit with spontaneity. Um, that if you are spontaneous is the Holy Spirit. If you are prepared, it's not the Holy Spirit. So it's a very narrow way of understanding the work of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, if you look at the Holy Spirit's work, he's always worked in a context of order and proper protocol. So in the temples of the, in the tabernacle of the Old Testament, it is, look at the fastidiousness with which all those things were done. Everything was done meticulously. And it is when it is done perfectly and meticulously that the Holy Spirit manifests. So when uh, Moses had meticulously gone through all the processes God says he should go through, the glory of God came upon uh, the, the tabernacle. The same with, with David. Uh, worship in David's time was very orderly, very meticulous. Um, the early Pentecostals were mostly illiterates. And, and, and so from 1906 in Azusa Street in California, when the, this era of Pentecostalism started, they were mostly illiterates. And so there was a lot of spontaneity, you know, the, with what they did. And God used their spontaneity. But it gave us the impression that if we are spontaneous, that's the Holy Spirit. If you plan, that's not the Holy Spirit. Um, I've been influenced by many people in my Christian life. I mentioned Billy Graham. Um, you wouldn't call him a Pentecostal, but uh, he influenced me a lot in, in the way I preach and process my expression. Uh, the other person is Catherine Kuhlman, who I believe is one of the most phenomenal human beings that God used in the last century, the 20th century, to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit. And Catherine Kuhlman's healing ministry as of now, I think is one of the most remarkable uh, in its, its definiteness. Uh, and, and, you know, she took time to verify every healing. She didn't just take testimonies. There had to be doctor verification, doctor reports to verify this miracle has taken place. And quite outstanding things took place. And one of the marks of Catherine Kuhlman's ministry was order. In fact, if you went to her meeting and you said the Holy Spirit was upon you and started speaking in tongues, she would take you out of the service. Everything was very orderly because she said the Holy Spirit is an orderly spirit. And really, when you read through the Bible, uh, the Holy Spirit moves in order. Uh, but somehow, uh, people have developed uh, the concept that if you are disorderly, what they call booga booga, uh, <laughs> that's the Holy Spirit moving. That is our own expression. But we shouldn't impose that on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't need our disorder for him to be the Holy Spirit. You can be the most meticulous planned service and he would move. And he would move very powerfully because the move of the Holy Spirit is not associated with disorder and necessarily spontaneity. That's very All right. So in some Christian gatherings, sometimes they, they, it's characterized by um, uncontrollable behaviors. How then do we discern the genuine move of the spirit from the ungenuine? Um, I, I think that when the Holy Spirit is at work, he's working with human beings, and the human being's personality comes in. So sometimes, you know, I, I don't get emotional. That, that's my personality. I'm a very together person. So I'm, I'm always together in my thoughts, in, in the way I evaluate things. There are people who are more emotional. So when the Holy Spirit is moving through me, my personality of order will be seen. In another person who is a little bit more uh, spontaneous, you will see that. I think it's very difficult to then use that as whether this is of God or that is not of God. But, but generally, we have to judge everything by the Bible. Is the fruit of that ministry honoring Christ? Uh, does it honor the church? Does it honor the believer? Because if somebody is saying the Holy Spirit is leading me to pray for you, but I end up disgracing you, 
then, you know, what, what is the value of that? I, I'm doing you good and harming you at the same time. Or, or the Holy Spirit gives me a word about you, but the word ends up disgracing you and devaluing you before people. Then what is the value? So in, in ministry, we have to look at the worth of the human being, the image of God that we, are, we must protect. We must look at sanctity of relationships. So if you see the Holy Spirit is leading you uh, and to tell you, Pastor Eric, uh, Pastor Patrick is the one who is destroying your ministry. Um, am I dividing chief friends? Uh, even if it's the Holy Spirit's leading, is that how to carry it? You know, Paul said that there were things he had been, that have been revealed to him that he doesn't speak about. So our ability to honor human life, respect people, respect families, respect relationships, respect the, the, the sense of dignity of a human being. So when I'm praying for somebody, I will not lay my legs on the person. Uh, does it mean if I do it, the person may not be healed? They may be healed, but I'm devaluing the human being in the process. So all of these things have to be thought through. Um, and, and I know that sometimes peculiar things can be done, but we shouldn't be so peculiar that the peculiar becomes our routine and not the exception. In the life of Jesus, the peculiar was the exception, not the routine, uh, because he was also minded to honor the people that he was ministering to. Doc, still exploring what happens when the Holy Spirit moves in a place. Do believers become unconscious, lose consciousness or self-awareness when the Holy Spirit is at work? Um, I would answer it two ways. When you are a very young believer, the presence of the Holy Spirit can be very overwhelming to you that it will seem as if you are not in full control of what you are doing. But uh, for an older believer, as you grow in the Lord, the presence of the Holy Spirit settles. So his move settles. What seemed to be unsettling you must settle uh, at a point. So uh, we don't lose control of ourselves. Um, the, the only thing is you also are aware there is something working in you that is beyond you. So it's, it's almost like there is, there is, I mean, sometimes when you're preaching, you may be saying something, and you just know this is not just me talking. You, you just know at this point, it's not just me. It's, it's something else we know is the Holy Spirit uh, releasing this out of me. So I haven't lost consciousness. I know I'm aware of what is happening. I can describe it. I can actually diagnose it later on and, and all of that. So I haven't lost consciousness. Now, in African traditional religion, which is where most of us take our spiritual reference from, uh, when people are under the influence of a deity, they almost always lose control of themselves. Uh, so the deity takes over their faculties, and sometimes they do all kinds of bizarre things. That's not how the Spirit of God moves. It doesn't take possession of us where we lose our faculties because the Bible says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. The Holy Spirit is not subject to the prophet, but the spirit of the prophet because the Holy Spirit uses the spirit of the prophet and that spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So there are certain things, for example, I can see something about you and decide not to say it. Because if I say it in this audience, the outcome would not be good. But I can tell you later after the service that this is what I picked up when, when the service was going on. Because it's subject to me. I can decide to do it this way or do it another way. And, and that's how the Holy Spirit uses us. We are not beside ourselves. We are in full charge of our faculties and can uh, do the right thing by people uh, through the working of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Okay. So, Doc, in the translation of the Bible from um, Greek to English, some versions use ghost. Ghost. <laughs> ghost, in ghost. place of spirit. 
Holy Ghost. Refer to the Holy Spirit. So, so there are some versions refer to him as Holy Ghost. Okay. Others Holy Spirit. Why? You know, you know, when I was a younger Christian, you know, in the 70s, um, we had a very powerful visitation of the Holy Spirit uh, in our group. I wasn't a pastor then. I was part of a youth group. Um, and, you know, we, we felt the Holy Ghost was more powerful than Holy Spirit. You know, I mean, <laughs> somehow the word ghost had some, has a mystique about it, exactly. Holy Ghost. But it's just uh, Old English and New English. Um, old English, the Old King James, at the time it was being translated, ghost was the word for spirit. That's all. You know, but I know that in, in, in our culture, when we say ghost, we have a different interpretation. But in English, ghost is spirit. So as the, the language progressed, uh, you see that the newer translations of the Bible will say spirit, Holy Spirit, instead of Holy Ghost. So it's one and the same person. Uh, one is his uh, old English name, and the other is a modern English name. I like the part about the, the ghost being more powerful than the <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Pastor Eric. Yeah. Uh, we read about Elisha asking for a double portion from Elijah. Is the Spirit of God measurable? Um, the, the Spirit of God was on Christ without measure. So, yes, we can measure that. There, there, there are uh, outpourings that are heavier. It's not that it's a different Holy Spirit. But his work in people is not the same. His work in people is not the same. Now, when, when Elijah asked for that, uh, is he was asking for the spirit of Elijah, which is not exactly the Holy Spirit. Okay, so, so basically he's asking for the office that he sits in, the office of the prophet of Elijah. He's saying, I want to be in your office and literally do twice or do more, greater. I want to do greater than yours. But the language there uh, is couched to give the impression that Elijah's spirit can be doubled. But Elijah's spirit cannot be doubled. But the impact of his prophetic office can be doubled. So in that particular context, it's not a double of the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's... that's if you just joined us, this is time with Pastor Otabu. We are enjoying this period where we are just getting to the scripture to understand the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And for me, it's been very instructive and very helpful in putting solid blocks to the issues that we need to understand about who exactly the Holy Spirit is. It's now your turn for us to bring the questions that you have asked for Pastor Otabu to speak to you and Pastor Patrick. What do you have in the basket? Okay, so this Loretta from uh, Loretta Giddy. And um, she asks, please, I would like to know which one comes first in a relationship, love or trust? Oh, because I talked about relationships exactly. a bit last, last week. Yeah. Yes. Uh, which one comes first, love or, or trust? trust? Hmm. <laughs> uh, I would think trust. I think trust. Um, my personal view, I think love is overblown. Um, I think the most important thing in a relationship is respect. Um, you know, in time past, people married, literally, people will marry for you. You meet your bride the day of the wedding. And some of those people married for 70 years, 60 years, had great marriages, never divorced, peace. And you can't say they were attracted by love. But they stayed together because they respected each other. And there was trust, and it worked. So I, I think trust is, in, is, is important. Um, love is also important. I'm, I'm not really sure, but I think trust, trust is, uh, comes first. So Lauren, is it Lauren? She, Loretta. Loretta. She's asked me a difficult question. <laughs> I can't answer. <laughs> Let's stay in the basket. And Doc, still from last week, Terry Mante is asking, how do you distinguish between a demonic affliction and a test. And which one do you think Job encountered? I mean, we know Job's was a test, uh, but the test was implemented 
through an adversary. Uh, so, yes, it could be an adversary that God permits to act, and it's a test in your life. Jesus was tested in the wilderness, and we know uh, who was testing him. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's Satan who was doing it, but it was a test. Um, it, so there can be afflictions um, of this nature, and it will be a test. So, I mean, the two can, can be together. But, yeah. Patrick, All sorry, right. sorry. Um, Edward Ezra Tamba from Morovia, Liberia. How can the Bible help in strengthening one's self-esteem and personality? How can the Bible help in one's self-esteem and personality? It depends on how you read the Bible, really. I mean, if you read the Bible from a very judgmental point of view and, and see God as this big guy in the sky who is looking to kick people about and, and hurt people, then your self-esteem will be destroyed. I mean, you, you will not see that. It will help you. But if you, if you see God in his totality, he's merciful. Yes, he's a God of judgment and wrath, but he's a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. Uh, he's a God who demands so much from us but he's also a God who gives so much to us. Uh, and so th there's a balance of him. And, and first to know that uh, God has created you. He loves you. He has a plan for you, and he's working out his plan for your life. And so no matter what you are, you are here because God willed for you to be here. You are here because he wants you to be here. And you are here... Uh, he wants you to be here because there is something essential that cannot be done except you are here to do it. And, and that, if anything, should boost your self-esteem. It means that you are required in existence, and that's why you exist. And, and he, has, he has given you what it is to make your life meaningful and significant whilst you are here on earth. And, and th that's the story of the Bible. That, that's exactly what the Bible tells us. So when you, when you break things down like this, it helps demystify the Holy Spirit and makes you want to know him more. So my big question is, why are Christians so fearful of the Holy Spirit? It's the way the Holy Spirit is portrayed. Um, I've had some interesting experiences from my younger years as a Christian, and sometimes there's a lot of abuse, uh, a lot of... And I think most of those people didn't know any better. Uh, and so the Holy Spirit is seen as a very terrifying personality. Uh, and, and instead of people seeking to fellowship with him, they seek to run away from him and want other people to re relate to him. And it, when you are okay, <laughs> come and tell me. It's almost like what the children of Israel told Moses on Mount Sinai. They said, you go, I go and talk to God. And after you finish, you come and tell us what he said. And I think people get scared with the Holy Spirit. They feel he'll reveal their secrets. He will embarrass them. Because sometimes you go to a service and somebody embarrasses you and says the Holy Ghost uh, who is or Holy Spirit leading them to embarrass. And so we embarrass people. We diminish people. Uh, we make people feel very, very unworthy in the name of the Holy Spirit. And so this, there's no desire to know this Holy Spirit who embarrasses us and who minimizes us. And, and who is revealing our secrets to the whole world. Uh, but when we get to know him for who he is, that these are excesses of people and not necessarily the character of the Holy Spirit, then we, we can really relate to him. So definitely there's so much more that we'd like to learn in the next edition about the Holy Spirit. But if you could give us your closing thoughts for today about the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the Holy Spirit wants to relate to every believer. He makes Christ known to us. He presents Christ to us. He shows us the nature, the heart of Jesus Christ. It is he whom we receive when we get born again. He is the one who leads us into all truth. He opens the scripture to us. He is God, and we must know him. And we must experience him for ourselves. And I, I trust that each one of us will seek a relationship with the Holy Spirit that is true to the scripture and that ennobles and, and, and the human being that has also been created in his image. Thank you so much, sir. If there is one thing that I would like you to do, call a friend 
call a loved one, tell them in the next edition of Time with Pastor Tebo, this discussion about the Holy Spirit will definitely continue and there's so much more that we want to learn. You also want to send your questions so we can ask Pastor Tebo to bring more light from the power of Scripture. So join us next week for Time with Pastor Tebo as we continue the discussion about the Holy Spirit. Also note that coming Sundays, our first fruit Sunday, it's a special invitation to you to join us online and on air as we come before the Lord and as the Lord brings us a word to strengthen us in a time like this. Let me recommend Word to Go to you. It's a five-minute bite of reflection by Pastor Tabo every Monday through to Saturday. It comes out in the morning at 7 a.m. Look out for it and be strengthened thereby. I would like to kindly request Pastor Tabo to pray for all of us to have a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. So if you want to know him, the Holy Spirit, he's present. He's actually been here before you came, and he lives in you if you are a believer. If you're not a believer, you can invite him into your heart. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, make yourself real to your children, to the believers. Let your voice be clear. Let your movement be discerned. Help us to know when you are speaking, when you are silent, when you are moving, and when you have stopped moving. Help us to discern your impulses and help us to discern your guidance in all that you do. And I pray that you will become more and more sensitive to him as he leads you every day in your walk of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Coming Sunday, join us for church service online and on air as Pastor Otabel brings you a word in season to inspire and strengthen you. It's a single service from 7.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. 